Hey everyone, before we get into tonight's stories, I have another Halloween related question for you to ruminate on while you listen. This one shouldn't be that difficult. What's your favorite Halloween candy? When you went trick-or-treating as a kid or when you go trick-or-treating and you take candy from your kids' bags, what are you searching around for? What are you hoping to get? I've always been a huge fan of Reese Cups and Snickers, but I'll take a Milky Way as well. Those are like maybe my top three, but I'd love to hear what you all think down in the comment section below. Let me know. And what are your plans for this Halloween? I'd like to hear that as well. I always loved this time of year, or since I was old enough to appreciate the joy in it. My father would get just as excited as I would when it was time to adorn our festive garb and begin the quest for sugary goodness. While we passed by other parents walking with their little ghouls and goblins, my dad would just smile at the expressions he would receive, being one of the few who took the season as seriously as children. Whatever costume I wore, he had something to match. If I dressed as a vampire, he would be my elder, watching over his apprentice. While we would sometimes choose a more fun theme, like the year we went to Shrek and Donkey with me being the latter, we often went for something far more sinister. Evil clowns, father and son zombies in search of brains to go with our candy, and of course, the aforementioned vampire duo, fit with fake blood splashed across our faces to assure any of the unsuspecting homeowners we would visit that we had our fill for the night, seeking only some goodies for dessert now. I suppose it was that very thing that didn't cause me more than a second glance at the particularly unsettling dressed kid while I went door to door with my son last year. As always, the streets were positively packed with extravagantly dressed children. Some walked alongside their folks while others traveled in packs. This one, though, he strolled the sidewalks alone. The first time we passed him, I was honestly quite impressed by how realistically the blood splatter was applied to his leathery apron. The blink-faced mask that was designed to look like some sort of creepy porcelain doll had more specks of those crimson stains, looking as though it had gushed from the left. Given that was the hand in which he held the gore-lined butcher's knife while the other swung the pillowcase half-filled with candy by his side, I had to admire the attention to detail. He was a little taller than my son, who was only eight at the time, but I still couldn't help but wonder why any parent would allow their child to walk the streets alone, even if there were a great many other children out that night. For a moment, I considered approaching the boy to inquire if he needed help, or perhaps wanted to join us, but when Maddie vigorously pulled my hand to the right, having noticed another house with their porch light shining brightly, I just let out a chuckle before allowing myself to be dragged to the side. By the time I turned my head back to the road, I saw no trace of the eerie little kid. Following in my father's footsteps, I would never miss spending this time with my son. I carried the tradition of getting equally as dressed up as Maddie, allowing him to choose the year's theme, as my dad had with me. Though my boy wasn't quite as much into the scary stuff as I was at his age, I managed to gently nudge him into dressing as zombie versions of his requested Captain America and Spider Kid. Spider-Man, Dad, he would insist whenever I called him that, but it was strangely adorable how flustered he would get in correcting me. <laughs> All right, three-foot Spider-Man, I said with a laugh, to which he giggled and playfully slugged me in the gut before thwipping to the next house. It was maybe ten minutes later when we passed the lone trick-or-treater in the porcelain mask again, but he looked a little different. There were a few rips across the sleeves of his stained white shirt, as well as the leather-like apron. It's very possible that I simply hadn't noticed it before, but I could swear he had more blood splashed across him now. I like your costume, he said, not so much as glancing up at me when we walked by. His voice was gravelly and monotone almost making me think of a 50-year-old two-pack-a-day smoker rather than a young boy. His tone was still as light as anyone whose voice had not yet broken, but the raspiness, it was nothing short of unnerving. I like yours too, I replied, most sincerely. I glanced back at the kid after he walked by to see that there was just as much blood across his back as his front. 
He creeps me out for sure, but I still convinced myself it was nothing more than an effective performance of one fully embracing their chosen character. The fact that his pillowcase appeared more bulging than the last time I saw him was enough for me to believe that he was just really into the season. Perhaps he had a water gun filled with red water tucked away under his apron to apply more as the night went on. The sticky-looking gore on his knife looked no different than it did last time, as far as I could tell anyway, so I just shook off my overactive imagination. For the remainder of our night of trick-or-treating, I only caught one more glimpse of the boy, this time from a distance. Again, he looked as though he was even more bloody than before, but given how far away he was, as well as the darkness surrounding him between the sporadic street lamps, I didn't dwell on it. Once Maddie began to whine about his feet hurting, I felt confident in the knowledge that we had accumulated more than enough goodies and it was time to head back home. The previously crowded sidewalks had only the occasional group making their way in one direction or another, each looking as wiped out as we were. Moments later, I was carrying my son with his overstuffed bag of candy looped around my shoulder. He'd pulled up his mask to nuzzle his face into the nape of my neck, and I couldn't help but smile as I recalled resting in my father's arms this way. Can I have some candy when we get home? He said, lifting his head, sounding as though he was on the brink of drifting away into dreamland. I gotta check it all first, kiddo. I know, but can I pick something out and you can check that first? I just really want to... A wide and exhausted yawn cut his words short, inspiring him to rest his head back into its previous spot. I just really want a Reese's cup. <laughs> we'll see when we... When I noticed the silhouetted figure limping out from behind a house on the corner, one that signified we'd almost reached our destination, it took me a second to realize who it was. The boy held neither his bag of candy nor the gore-lined blade as he shuffled toward me. Help! He called out as he struggled to push himself forward. It was then that I heard a rage-fueled scream, not from the kid, but from the man who pursued him. As he rounded the side of the house the boy was trying to escape, I saw the far more realistic bloodstained knife in his hand. I knew I had to act quickly, but my first and most crucial task would be to secure the safety of my son. After another quick glance to assure myself the man chasing the boy down had only one target in mind, I set Maddie down on the sidewalk, looping the candy around his arm with our home being just on the other side of the street, just beyond the stoop ahead. I gave him one mission. Run home, Maddie. Run home and don't look back. When you get there, tell mommy to call the police, okay? He nodded and took off in the direction of our home. I felt my stomach lurch with the thought of him making his way back home on his own, even if it was only a minute or two on foot. Still, I knew I had to get him as far away as possible before I did what I had to. By the time I reached the front of the house, the boy in the blood-stained apron was staggering away from the tall and well-built man was almost atop of him. Hey! I yelled out as I ran toward him, hoping to get the attention of the man who seemed to growl as he ran for the kid. Taking no time to second-guess my actions, I tackled the guy as he lunged at the kid. It was as I raised the man I'd planted onto the grass, knocking the knife out of his hand, that I saw the four deep and grizzled gashes across the right side of his face. When the boy in the porcelain mask walked up beside me, pointing his finger at the man, I noticed the fresh blood tissue caked to his fingernails. He stabbed me, he said, hiccuping with tears trickling down his mask. I didn't do nothing to him, but he cut me anyway. The man gazed up at the kid with wide and almost shocked eyes while still attempting to break free. When I called out, hoping to get the attention of some of the neighbors, he caught me across the face with his fists, instantly causing my head to spin. As he took the opportunity to lunge for the kid a second time, I felt my body roll to the ground while the boy let out a high-pitched yelp. It only took a few seconds for my senses to return, but when I looked up to see the man clutching the child in the blood-soaked apron by his good leg, I had no time to waste. Again, I jumped on the guy, deflecting another attempted attack on my swelling face while jabbing at his midsection. Run, kid, I said, trying to grab the writhing man by his arms to hold him in place. As the boy began to back away, a few other people left their homes to see what was going on. Some of them ran up, quickly assisting me in keeping the man from reaching his target. 
when I was able to release my grasp on the guy, trying to ignore the pulsing pain from where he had clocked me, I turned to look back at the likely traumatized boy. When I saw no trace of him, I was momentarily worried that someone had snatched him up amid all the craziness. I suppose that's the fatherly instinct, to go straight to a worst-case scenario when it was far more likely that he'd headed back to his home after such a fright. Still, though, I hadn't had a chance to see how badly he was wounded, and I knew he would require medical assistance. After a while, the police arrived at the scene, wasting little time in cuffing the man whose blood was still dripping on his shoulder. Paramedics rolled up moments later, one of whom who checked me out to make sure my swollen shut eye was nothing more than a well-cleaned clock, while the other attended the guy with his hands bound behind his back. Nobody knew anything about the kid in the blood-stained apron, nor did anyone have any idea where he'd run off to. Over the next few hours, several more cars rolled up to the house on the corner, just past the stoop. The yellow tape had already sealed the place away from the public by that point, but I had to stick around for a bit to answer some questions. Once I was permitted to leave, I returned to my home to find Maddie passed out on the couch with a few empty Reese's wrappers on the coffee table beside him. I explained everything that had occurred to my wife before taking a well-earned shower. Becca prepared an ice pack for my eye while I cleaned myself up, which honestly felt heavenly when I held it to my puffy face. It wasn't until the following morning that I walked out to meet the group of onlookers to see a healthy amount of police doing their job, taking a little note of the curious observers. It would seem that... I had arrived just in time to watch them remove the bodies from the house, those that were buried in the basement. I watched in horror as they carried out the body bags, seven of them in all. The idea that someone capable of such acts lived so close to us was bad enough, but the fact that the subdivision was filled with kids the previous night, many of whom may have knocked on his door, almost caused my breakfast to escape. When one of the officers who had questioned me waved me over as I stared on from the other side of the street, I wasn't sure what else I could offer to the investigation. As two other cops opened up a large trunk they had retrieved, the box that held the trophies this bastard kept commemorate his foul deeds, I found myself truly lost for words. The blood-splattered porcelain doll mask sat upon a variety of other objects, each wearing its own faded crimson stains. From what I could tell, all the items in the chest were from one child's Halloween costume or another, as this was the season in which the sinister owner of the house liked to hunt. The officer kept me somewhat in the loop of the investigation over the weeks that followed, as she was just as befuddled as I was about the child who somehow tore into the face of his murderer from beyond the grave. She admitted she'd witnessed more than her fair share of bizarre things since joining the force, but we were both saddened and heartbroken by the crimes they uncovered. After the identities of the victims were discovered and their grieving parents were given the news of the truth of their children's disappearance, we finally had a name for the lone trick-or-treater. The 11-year-old Zachary Walsh had somehow gotten separated from the group he walked sidewalks with that Halloween night the year before. He lived in a neighborhood many miles away, but just about everyone in that subdivision looked for him for hours after hearing about his disappearance. Unfortunately, he'd likely already been snatched up by the time the search party even had a chance. My heart aches for the boy, as well as the others who lost their lives to that son of a bitch, but I hope their parents at least have some closure now. Given that young Zachary was the most recent of the sick bastard's victims, I can't say why he chose to skip this Halloween, with it being his hunting season and all. I wonder if perhaps we managed to stop him before he had the chance. Maybe that was the young boy's mission all along, to stop his killer before he was able to add a new trophy to his precious box. Halloween feels a little different this year. Yes, Maddie and I are just as excited as ever, but I don't know if it'll ever be the same for me. My son gave me free reign on what our costumes would be this time, and he's quite the perceptive kid. 
I'm sure he can tell that I'm far more distracted than usual, but maybe dusting off the old vampire outfits my father and I wore so many years ago will get me back into the spirit. Take from this tale what you will. Be it just another spooky story for the haunting hour or even the ravings of a gullible idiot. Whatever the case, just please do me one favor. Keep a close eye on your children, whether they're by your side as they go door to door in search of goodies or traversing the sidewalks and a group of fellow candy seekers. Make sure they know not to stray. You can never tell if the truly horrific monsters of this world look anything like the personification of their nature or live just a few doors down from where you rest your weary bones each night. The egg left my hand even as my fingers curled in to stop it, slipping past my fingertips and sailing in a hard arc toward the rundown mansion's front door. I had misgivings about this from the start. It wasn't that it was a big deal, not really, just throwing some eggs at the door and maybe tossing some toilet paper up in a tree if we found a good one, but it still felt mean-spirited rather than fun. The Mercer house had been in decline before me, Pat, and Jasper were even born, and seeing it in person, even at night, was like walking up on an unburied corpse in the graveyard. I felt scared and sad at the same time, and more than a little like we were kicking someone or something that was already down. Come on, we did it, now come on. Pat smirked at Jasper before looking back at me. Don't you still have three more eggs? I frowned at him. Yeah, and I'm done. If someone actually lives there, they're going to have to clean this shit up, so let's get some beer, get drunk, and watch scary movies. Jasper nodded. You know, that does sound like a solid plan. I'm behind this drunk, scary movie idea. Pat grimaced. <sighs> Fine, whatever. It's not like they'll notice the mess. He gestured at the overgrown yard and the massive wall of hedges behind us. When we'd come up the driveway through the gate, the black wall of leaves had been the first thing I'd noticed. It had supposedly once been a huge hedge maze, but it must have grown into an even larger, twisted monstrosity in the decades since the property stopped being kept up. Just from what we could see, it was maybe 30 feet tall in some spots. Shrugging, I glanced back at the front porch. There was no light there other than a single glowing jack-o'-lantern, and no sign that anyone had noticed the seven eggs we'd thrown against the door. Such a stupid, petty thing to do. And why? Because we were bored and too cheap to go to a regular haunt or something? It's still shitty of us. Let's... Let's just go. Turning toward the driveway, I didn't wait to see if they followed, but I figured they would. Jasper was as tired of this as I was, and to be fair, it was my car hidden down the road from the driveway. If Pat didn't want to walk, then he... I slowed to a stop as I rounded the corner of the hedge maze and looked toward the driveway gate. It was shut now. Guys, isn't this the way we came in? I looked behind me to see Jasper approaching with a concerned look with Pat sullenly following behind. I mean, isn't this the driveway we used walking up? Jasper looked at me and then the gate and then back to me. Shit, I thought so. But it wasn't closed before. He glanced back as he hissed out a nervous whisper. Pat, the gate is closed. Frowning, Pat picked up the pace and rounded the corner with us. What the fuck? Nah, this, this must be the wrong way. Stupid brick wall around the whole thing's making it dark and shit. We must have gotten turned around. Must have come in on the other side. I felt my chest tightening slightly. Or someone shunned behind us. I pointed to the wall. We can't get over that. Or the gate if it's locked. He rolled his eyes. Or we messed up and it's dark and... It's not that dark. The moon is full or close enough. Someone could have left the gate open and then closed it when we came in. Why? Is that like a trap us for Halloween? Good fucking luck with that. I'll beat their ass if someone comes to try and mess with us, and we can always call for help. No, we 
can't. Jasper's voice was slightly jittery and shrill. Jesus, I told you this afternoon there's no signal up here. Iron deposits in the area or something, I don't know, but... I, I never had signal when I drove by before, and... He checked his phone with an English look. Yep. Still nothing. I could tell Pat was getting scared too, but it only seemed to make him angrier. Whatever. The gate probably just blew shut, but it's not even locked. Let's just open it and leave. Not waiting for a response, he stalked off toward the gate with us following behind. When he reached it, it only took a couple of hard yanks to see that it wasn't opening. And looking closer, I saw the steel rods slid down into the ground under the gate. What the hell? This isn't just some old gate that blew shut. This is high-grade shit. Magnetic locks with titanium bolt mechanics. I worked on a couple of jobs with my dad that had stuff like that. Jasper brushed a shaky hand over the brown grapes and leaves rot into the gate face. None of this is old. It was just painted and made to look that way. He met my eyes. What is this place? A loud crackle filled the air, making us jump. Then the voice, rich and deep and warm sounding, even through the tiny distortion of hidden speakers both near and far, all broadcasting the same message. Sorry, boys. Gate's been closed for the night. If you don't want to spend Halloween here, you best get to step in through the maze. The entrance isn't far from where you were, and on the far side is a gate that leads back out to the driveway on the outside, and that gate will stay unlocked until sunrise. Pat slammed his fist into his thigh. This is bullshit. He turned toward the house and back to me. We should just go up there, beat on the door, and tell him if he doesn't open the gate, then we'll come in there and open it for him. I felt a surge of anger as I stepped toward him. No, are you fucking high? I don't want to get arrested for trespassing and vandalism, and I sure as shit am not going to get arrested for home invasion or because you decide to be an even bigger asshole than usual. I glanced at Jasper. So we're going into this fucking maze or whatever. We'll either figure it out or we'll push through it until we get to the other side. Pat lowered his gaze, but I could tell he was still furious. What happens when we find the other gate locked, or that there is no other gate? Jasper spoke up. Then we climb the head shit and get out over there. It has to be easier than trying to climb the walls here. There's nothing out here to stack up or stand on, and that gate... He gestured behind us. Higher up, the vines have thorns all over him. He looked uneasy. I don't like any of this either. But I also don't want to be here any longer than we have to. Let's just try the maze. If it's too overgrown or whatever, we can always try something else. Pad looked between us, his face falling. Fuck it. Let's just go then. The entrance to the garden maze was only twenty or so feet down from where we had been egging the house and peering inside. Neither the moonlight or our phone's flashlights showed any sign of the maze being impassable or fully overgrown. Nothing about it looked tended, but the ghost paths of white crushed gravel were still there, faint and glowing in the meager light. All while the walls of the maze were thick and twisting, we could always see a way forward as we took our first tentative steps inside came to a stop when we reached our first branch. Forward or left. Jasper's voice shrouded thin in the dark. What do y'all think? Pat sniffed. Left. I read one time that you always go left in a maze and you won't get lost. I stared at him. That makes no sense. It would depend on the maze. He shrugged. And then you pick. This is your big idea. I felt the urge to yell at him, to tell him that this was classic Pat, pushing us into some stupid idea and then blaming us when it backfires. But no, it didn't matter now. And he didn't hold a gun to our head anyway. We were all idiots, and now we were going to get bit by the snake or something because some crazy old guy wanted to punish trickers and fuck. I sighed. Left. We went left, 
and then left again, but the next two times we had to go straight because there was no left option. I thought we'd been walking about five minutes, and based on that, I figured we must be getting into the middle of the maze. How big could it actually be, after all? As though to confirm it, we reached a larger courtyard. Along the edge of the square were rusted wrought iron benches, and in the middle was a massive white fountain, though much of it was covered with dirt and patches of vines from decades of disrepair and disuse. Pat bumped into me, and I turned to see him staring up at the top of the fountain's third and tallest tier. Is that a dinosaur up there? Following his gaze, I pointed my light up there and squinted. Uh, I think it's an alligator. I felt warm spray hit my back a moment before I heard the muffled snap of something behind me. The screaming didn't start until I was halfway turned, and by then I could already see the Jasper making that horrible sound. He, uh... He was five feet up in the air, jerking back and forth sideways, held by something unseen that was shaking him, crushing him, biting him. He let out another wail, and I saw more blood squirt in a dozen places from his lower legs to the middle of his chest. I was staring in silent, horrified shock, but Pat was squealing beside me like a boiling tea kettle. Oh god, oh god, oh god, oh god, it has him! It has him! I took a step forward to help him, but I hesitated. What was to stop this hidden thing from taking me too? And what could I really do to help? Jaster was already twisted and broken, and his cries, while still loud, were growing weaker. Another crushing bite down and a spray of blood hit me in the face, causing me to flounder back and fall down. Some instinct immediately surged through me, saying I had to get up, I had to keep my feet, or I was dead. I had to get away, or I was dead. And in that moment of terrifying clarity, I thought I saw a shadow of what the thing was that had my best friend. It had a long snout and a flat, rigid head deep red eyes and a muscular body that was impossibly long and thick and huge. I thought it might have looked at me while it bit down harder into Jasper, but then I couldn't see it anymore and I was up on my feet again. Grabbing Pat's arm, we ran out of the square and around the corner of the next path. And that's when the speaker sprang to life again. I see you've met Bogard. Now don't you worry. While he does have a rather rapacious appetite, he is judicious in his meals as they come along so rarely these days. I wager he'll savor his meal before seeking another. As for what he is, <laughs> well that's no need to bore you with the grisly details of my family's past, but suffice it to say, there was a time when my ancestors were quite a force in this area. We were one of the founding families of the town of Empire, as a matter of fact. By the time my great-grandfather came along, he had family's wealth, but only a portion of his predecessor's talents. His greatest accomplishment, other than serving my grandfather, of course, was binding Bogard into this place. Spirit binding is not an easy thing. My great-grandpap spent many years trying to bind the spirits of various people and animals to his will to various places or objects. Some showed promise, but most were an abject failure. That is, until... He got a group of big-name game hunters to run down and trap the biggest, meanest gator they could find in Louisiana. Got shipped all the way here on a freight train, and it's been told that it barely fit, though I don't know if that's true. In any case, he spent the best part of a year inuring that beast so that when he did the final rituals, the thing's true self would be left bound to the place that you're in. The man died just a few years later, despite his attempts at longevity, and for the longest time, poor old Bogard was just left to run the maze by his lonesome. He can't leave it, you see. He's bound to my family's blood into that maze. So, because I'm a nice fella and all, I try to give him entertainment when I can. I don't know that a ghost gator has much need for food, but damn if he doesn't seem to like the taste. We were still running, but it was just panic driving us, with no sense of finding a way out or keeping track of where we'd been. 
I could feel myself tiring out, and I was about to ask Pat if we should stop for a second and try to get our bearing when I heard a hundred snaps in the hedge wall just behind me. Letting out a cry, I turned around just in time to see a dark shape lunge out of the dark and bite off Pat's head. Oh, Jesus. Oh, fuck. Ooh, I guess I misspoke earlier about the measured pace of his consumption. It's been a while since we've had visitors up here. Just like me, he must get lonely. Pat's head was just... gone. And as I slowly backed away, I saw half his chest disappeared before the rest of him fell to the ground. Red and black pouring out across the white stone path. Above that growing stain, I could hear the invisible thing chewing. I kept backing up, terrified beyond all reason and knowing that running would do no good. It would run me down and eat me just like my friends, and that sick fuck would sit up in that house all by himself, laughing his ass off at his pet monster that his family trapped. Wait a minute. Forcing myself to stop was the second hardest thing I've ever done. Kneeling down on the path while that unseen thing ate more of Pat was the hardest. I had no way of knowing if this was going to work, but I didn't know what else to do or try, and if I was going to try, I needed to do it now. He just finished Pat's left leg. Keeping my voice low, I leaned forward. I... I don't know if you can understand me. Maybe you can, but you don't care. But, well, I didn't know that ghost alligators were a thing before tonight, and I don't have any better options than to try. Speed up, speed up, he's swallowing the last foot. Oh, God. So you're trapped here, so am I. We're both trapped because of that asshole. I pointed a finger into the air in the general direction of where I hoped the house might be. And his asshole family of magicians or necromancers or whatever the fuck they are. And, and I think I have a way of getting us both out if you'll hear me out. What are you doing? Praying? How droll. My little gator will make you scream. I felt cold air blow into my face, thick with the smell of blood and rot. Forcing down my urge to vomit, I took it as a good sign that I still had a face and all, and I started talking again. Whack. Come out, fuck face. Whack. I want to talk to you. Crack. The front door of the house splintered away in my last kick and bounced off the far wall. Looking inside, the house looked even more rotten and ramshackle than the outside, with peeling wallpaper and mounds of trash littering the hall. Where are you, fucker? How did you get out of the maze? I gritted my teeth into a grim smile. I was still terrified, but I was also so fueled by anger and adrenaline that I was pushing past all that fear for the moment. I had to keep going before I thought too much about anything. Sprinting forward, I turned right toward the voice I heard. The man was hiding around the corner, a wooden softball bat in his hands, snatching it from him when I jammed it into his stomach. Wouldn't you like to know, you fucker? Tell you what, come with me and I'll show you. Oh no, I called the police. I snorted. <laughs> I doubt it. But even if you did, how does that really help you? Throwing him down in front of me, I glanced around the room. It was filled with computer monitors, most of them showing camera feeds of the grounds and the maze. The one was paused on a video of children hitting a pinata. Oddly enough, in the corner of the room, I saw a craft table where a turkey pinata was halfway being made. I stared down at him. What kind of sick fuck are you? The man looked like he was in his sixties, with a fringe of gray hair and a pot belly, barely covered by a stained t-shirt. Wet-eyed and trembling, he looked up at me pleadingly. I... I have money, and I can get you whatever you want, anything... I smiled coldly at him. That's good, because the thing I want most is the sick fuck that killed my best friends. I want him to come with me for a little walk. No, 
No, don't. I hit him in the shoulder hard enough to feel something give. I'm not fucking asking. Grabbing him by his other arm, I pulled him up and drug him outside down the porch steps. He tried to resist at first, but when he saw I would just drag him, he started begging again, promising me things, threatening me. I ignored it all, and by the time we got to the entrance of the maze, he was just sniveling quietly. It's... it's not fair. I didn't hurt your friends. It did. Grabbing him by both his arms, I turned him to face me, his back to the opening of the maze. He let out a painful moan as I pressed into his broken shoulder. Oh man, I never thought about it like that. What a persuasive argument. I shoved him hard, taking him off his feet, and when he landed, he was inside the maze. Make it to him and see how he likes it. The old man was quick to get back onto his feet and was in the middle of a leaping clear maze's threshold when a shadow snatched him back and started to tear him apart. It may have been my imagination, but Bogart seemed to be chewing especially slowly this time. See, I figured out that your family's probably what's keeping him here, and if we get rid of you, maybe that'll get rid of whatever power you have on him. I let out a shaky laugh before continuing on. I had screamed to hear myself over the man's wet and weakening cries, but it was worth it. <laughs> See? He had to trust me and hope I was right. Lead me back out of the maze and wait for me to get you. Bring you to him. I guess he's desperate. And I guess you made both of us pretty desperate tonight. Just like that, the noise was gone. The man was gone. Swallowed whole as he screamed his last scream, stepping back away from the maze, my heart began to hammer again. What if it didn't work? Or what if it did work and he ate me anyway once he was out? My breath caught as I saw a dark shadow pass through the maze threshold and into the outer dark of the yard. There was a brief moment of silence, another stir of cold, fetid air, and I could feel him looking at me, weighing what to do, maybe. I'll never know, because the next second it was gone, and around the corner I heard the colossal screech of metal. Running around the edge of the maze, I saw the gate lay twisted and broken outside the wall. Blood loud in my ears, I ran for the driveway and then through the gate. I was still terrified and terribly sad, but there would be time for that later. For now, I had to follow the driveway down to the country road turn right and get into my car, get home and decide what to tell people and what not to. Running down the moonlit path, I couldn't help but feel a deep sense of gratitude amid all the other emotions. I was still here. I was alive. I was free. <laughs>